And welcome everyone. My name is Brendan Presner. I'm the Product Marketing Manager and Evangelist here at Deco Network. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Deco Network webinar, Embroidery for Caps. Now to make this happen, we're joined by someone who we call our Relationship Manager, but the rest of the industry rightfully refer to him as the Embroidery Guru. He loves his craft, but he loves it even more when he can share it with folks like you. And of course, that's Mr. Embroidery himself, Eric Campbell. G'day, Eric. <laughs> G'day, Brendan. I don't know if I'd call myself Mr. Embroidery, but I sure do a lot of it, you know? <laughs> and I don't like the word guru. I am not exactly sitting in a lotus position talking about embroidery and meditating just yet. I mean, not that I don't meditate once in a while, but <laughs> I am very happy to share what I know with you guys out here today. So I'm very happy everybody was here to show up, and uh, I can't wait to start talking about uh, all the different ways that embroidery is done on caps. So without any further delay, I'll hand over to Eric, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, Eric. Ah, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. So we're going to talk about embroidery for caps, and we're really going to go through the entire process of the embroidery for caps. So in this session, we're going to talk a lot about, about designing for caps, because honestly, even if you don't do design work yourself, uh, a lot of what we end up doing with caps is truthfully kind of bargaining with our customers. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the best ways to design for caps and things we can do to talk to our customers about caps and the best way to use caps so that we can kind of give them the best product we can. Uh, and what I want to say about that before we even start anything else is that one of the best things that you can do, um, at becoming an expert in your field is one thing, but presenting that to your customer as a consultancy, saying, I am a consultant, I am here to help you get the most bang for your buck out of your decorated apparel, it's going to bring more value to you. And if you were here for the pricing webinar, or if you're going to catch it later on the recording, uh, you'll see that Getting that unique value proposition is how you make more money, how you get better profit margins. So think of the part that we're talking about, designing for caps, which is a good chunk of this, as the kind of uh, armament you'll need to go into that fight with people about how they want to decorate their caps. And also the things that you can use to help them get the best bang for their buck. The second one we're going to have is selecting your substrate. Uh, substrate here is just a fancy word for saying your cap, the ground that you're going to embroider through. Um, we're going to talk about caps a little bit and what can and go wrong with caps, what usually causes trouble for people. And uh, really we're going to talk about what you want to do in selecting a cap and uh, what you can do to make your whole experience of embroidering caps better. Uh, the third piece there, digitizing for stability. It's something that there's, it's so detailed that I'm just going to give you some tips and some hints and a little bit of direction about how I digitize for hats. Um, as we can see down at the bottom before I get through this, uh, we're going to do how to hoop. We're going to talk about hooping caps a little bit and some tips I have about what I think is the best way to do it on uh, the most common cap frame I see used out there, the 270 degree wide uh, format frame, which is truthfully also one of the ones that causes people the most trouble when I talk to them. So uh, when I'm talking about all these things, it's not just my experience for the time I spent in shops. And I mean, I did almost 20 years in shops by myself. But I've spent a lot of time talking to people, writing for magazines, interviewing people, going out to the trade shows. So this is all this experience coming together of the things I've helped people with and consulted people with. And so one of the big things we're going to do is Q&A. Definitely use that question box. And we're going to hang out a little bit after this time for the presentation just to give you some chances to ask questions. If you have unrelated questions or just about CAPS, you know, go ahead and give them a shot. We might not be able to get to all the questions, but I'm here to answer the questions that you have. And uh, certainly, I'm going to whip through some of this information. If you miss something or if you don't understand something, ask those questions. We'll come back to them. So before we get going, the first thing I also want to say is you can stitch CAPS. I have tons of friends, especially some of the smaller shops where they literally farm out every CAP job or they turn cap jobs down because they're afraid to do them because they've had so much uh, spoilage, so many ruined caps, they're breaking needles, then it scares them. And so rather than risk their machines, risk themselves, have that ruin, they would like to just farm it all out. There are reasons to farm out cap jobs. And in fact, with so many people wanting decoration over the brim, uh, really large 3D foam treatments, sometimes this stuff makes more sense, especially when they have large counts to go to someone, to go to a cap vendor who does their decoration and do that. And this is coming from me who likes to do the art and likes to have that control. But what I want to say is when you have those orders in-house, you can stitch caps if you think about them holistically. And what I mean there is that you have to balance everything out. There's a lot of things that go into having a really great cap, the design, the digitizing, the way you stabilize, the way you hoop, and the way you run all come together to make it easier to make caps look their best. But you have to do all of it. Uh, frankly, if you just do one section of this, if you take really good care of how you hoop, but the digitizing terrible, you're gonna have a bad time. If you take really care, good care about the hat you select, but you don't hoop it very well, or you use the wrong materials, you're gonna have a bad time. So really, you're just gonna wanna make sure that you think about this holistically, and balance all these forces that are being exerted on the cap. You have to remember, we're going to stab a needle through a hat 
thousands of times at speed. It's going, it's going to cause distortion. It's going to pull and push on the hat, and we need to balance that out by using the different methods to make things work to their best effect. And we're going to start with designing for headwear. And I know this sounds like it's something that's basic, like everyone should understand what's going on, but really when you're talking to customers, they really don't necessarily understand that there are limited areas on a hat for decoration. Headwear is horizontal. As we're looking at that horizontal aspect there, we're looking at a big rectangle, we all understand that that's what we have to work with, but your customer may not. So one of the best things you can do is to show them that the best designs are short and wide because you have a limited vertical space and you have an extended horizontal space. I mean, really you have more room than you're going to have on a standard left chest for using on that hat. You can really address, especially in a 270 degree hat, a very wide range of that hat. Not everybody wants this huge design, but when they want impact, when they want coverage, the best way to get that is to have a short and wide logo or to reorganize the logo they currently have. So some of the best things you can do to help that is to literally show, especially when you're brick and mortar, if you're in a showroom with a customer, show them a printed out two size version of the addressable area generically on a hat. Now there's different hats that we're going to talk about later and the area we have on those hats. But if you show them the kind of area they have or superimpose that rectangle on their logo so they can see just how much coverage they have, you're going to help them to visualize the space that they have to work with. A lot of people really, you would think, because we do this business all day long, we're used to looking at things and interpreting them for the space that we're going to have and understanding how they're going to look on a finished garment. Your customer is not this person. They don't think about hats all day long. They don't think about embroidery or design. So they may not be able to visualize it. And truthfully, what I've found out is about 85% of the customers I had were not great at visualizing things unless they were shown. So show them that headwear is horizontal. And I like to show this example. It's from my uh, old company, Black Duck, which is the embroidery screen printing company I came from. Um, pretty often, our logo is in this vertical aspect, as you see on the left-hand side. A lot of our signage, especially we had signage that was shaped this way, would have this stacked look. And this is a very retro logo that we have on our old signs. And as you can see, kind of just a really plain, single-color de design, but it has a lot of small text down at the bottom. When you stack it, you can see that left-hand cap. You're just not getting a lot of coverage. If you imagine that what most of the stuff that we do is promotional in some fashion, now you can even say, okay, if it's fashion work, maybe, maybe if it's for team stuff, but the, the, they, they don't necessarily have to read everything there, but mostly when we're doing businesses, we're doing clubs, we're doing groups that have something they want to say, they have a message to get out there. If you can't read the message, you've made a mistake to some degree. Now, some people won't care. Some of the small text is just decoration. They're not going to care whatsoever, but in this particular case, we're talking about a business who's trying to show this is what my business does. That hat on the left gives you a very tiny exposure of the actual thing your business does, and the name itself isn't even very big. You look at that hat on the right where we've reorganized everything to get a very horizontal aspect of the logo, and without entirely changing the look, we've managed to get more than twice the coverage on the front of that hat, and we've managed to get visibility from much further back. So when you have an example like this, and in fact, we can, I can give you this example, showing your customer an example like this, or an example that you make yourself in a mock-up, will help them to understand that coverage. It's also a great thing when you have an online designer. I know I'm from Deco Network, as you know, and when you use an online designer, it's immediately visible to people when they're looking at a layout of a hat front and they've got their logo on top of it, they can see this coverage. But really, when you're working with customers, it's important for you to show them this and to explain, hey, you're trying to get your message out there. If you want your message to be seen and to be legible, it makes sense to make things large enough for them to work. I mean, they don't need to necessarily know, or it shouldn't be the first thing you say, that you know, small text may be difficult to embroider, especially on a stiff hat, or some of your logo elements are very small. But you may be able to come to the conclusion with them that they want to increase the size or work on some small detail because they want to get more bang for their buck. Tall, thin designs suffer on caps. And to show you yet another example, here's a piece that I did myself. Um, the customer came in with this specific cartoon character that was in the center. And you see what I've done is shown you the cartoon character that they brought in in the full art at the same height of the finished design we ended up with on the back of the FlexFit hat. And what you can see is that tall, thin character, if you would have executed it on that hat, you know, it would have been about the size of your thumb. The face that was on that character would be the size of the end of a pencil. There really wasn't much that you could see from any distance of that design. Now, 
what you end up having to do sometimes is suggest alternatives. And when I looked at this piece, I thought, you know, I understand they really love this character. What it turns out is it's actually a cartoon drawn of one of the people who works at this design shop that they did the rest of the hat, where we're actually going to see the front of this hat in a later slide. And the thing is, they really wanted to show this guy. They liked his attitude. They thought it was funny. So what they're, the interesting thing for them is they want to show this guy. And they, they thought, this is this character. And I said to them, okay, and I asked, what's essential? What's essential about this design? What is the thing that you really want to see? And they're like, well... You know, we like that it's got the logo, and you can see there's a logo on the shoes, the pants, they like the way he dresses, all this stuff. And I said, well, what's the thing you really want people to notice? They said his attitude. And I said, well, the attitude on this guy is in the smirk and the backwards hat. It's in his face, obviously. It's not his shoe. It's not his cargo shorts. It's the guy's face. So what I, what I suggest is I took the vector art, and I cropped it, and then they had this text that was also originally going to be underneath that cartoon character, by the way. They wanted to throw that all in a big vertical stack. And I said, actually, you know, let me show you a different design. This is what's essential. You want to see the guy's face. You're identifying with this particular character who's there. Let's crop it down to what's essential. And what I did, as you can see on the right-hand side, I cropped it down just to above the shoulder. We got a little bit of his shirt. You can definitely see his hat. And it gave me a chance to do some carving. As you can see, there's some dimensional satin stitches in the face and in the hair so that it stands up a little bit. There's some nice stitch angles there. And what it made for is a much better presentation. We got to really show the face. The face was very clear, even from a little bit of a distance. You could see that smirk. And they got the essential of what they needed out of it. I could have struggled and made that centerpiece work. We could have done that. But in the end, if you stood away from that hat, you wouldn't have seen anything about it. It would have been a generic guy. Maybe you could tell he was in a t-shirt. Maybe you could tell he had a hat on it. Maybe not. So really, honestly, you have to ask what's essential and suggest alternatives. The third thing there is coordinate, don't replicate. Now, what this means is when you have a logo, you don't just take that logo and stamp it on everything in the same format. You can alter it. Like the earlier logo I showed you from Black Duck, um, you want to coordinate. And what this means is, like, think about any major brand. Think about Nike. If you think about the Nike logo, you have seen that logo in a million colors, in a million orientations, with different texts under it, uh, in every sort of format you can think. Now, not everyone's logo is as clear or as uh, recognizable as the Nike logo. However, when you're working on a collection of garments, you just want to coordinate. If you have an element that's recognizable or a portion of the logo or the logo itself, maybe not with all the detail on it, maybe in not in the same color scheme, it can still coordinate and be part of a group of branded items. So you want to coordinate and don't replicate. So when people have logos that are small or difficult or vertical, you may be able to look for a horizontal version that they use for something else. Uh, maybe they use it for uh, stationary or some other reasoning that, that needs to be horizontal or signage. And you can find versions of their logo, versions of the design they want to do, or even portions like you see here that work better for the cap. And now we're going to talk a little bit about vertical safe heights. And the first thing I'm going to say about this you can tell that caps have different heights. These safe heights, I know that someone's going to jump up first thing and say, I run caps all the way to three inches tall. And I say, yeah, so have I. When we're talking about safe heights, the reason I throw it in the quotes, it's not that this is the, the maximum height you can get a design to run. What it is, is in my experience, these are the heights that are as close as I've gotten on multiple ranges of caps, different shapes and styles of caps that are roughly in the same profile range where I could be sure to get all of that height and still have registration and everything running correctly. As you can see in this little tableau of three hats here, on the left you have the old school trucker five panel, no seam down the front, but it has that real high peak in the front uh, dead center. You get a mid, a mid profile hat in the center there, um, and that mid profile hat is structured. It looks a little funny in the way it's folded there, but it is a structured hat. And then you've got, on the right-hand side, I actually went, even though I talked about low-profile hats here, I don't have one here, because honestly, a lot of low-profile hats, the unstructured hats, you can't even set them up like this, because they'll just fall into a pile. As you know, they almost have no structure at all to them. But what you do have there is what I'm calling a fourth category, military and visor. And people will say, hey, there's a lot more room on a military hat than a visor, and I'll agree with you there. The problem I've had with military hats, and we're actually going to see another example of this later on in the slides, is that military hats often have a seam running right horizontally across the front of the, the hat, and depending on how that seam is constructed, how thick the seam is, and whether or not the seam is straight or curved, it can really affect the way a design runs, and frequently I will run above that seam for picky clients. And frankly, in the business I used to work with, one of the chief things I did was handle people who other, other uh, shops didn't want to handle or had very difficult art. So they were usually very picky and didn't like the look of the seam running through the design. So what I'm showing you here, high-profile hats, we've got about a little over two and a half inches. 
Once again, doesn't mean you can't go higher than that. I've gone more than three. The thing is, as you can see in that trucker hat, there's something that both on, on any structured hat, really, on the mids and the highs, I like to call it the bubble, which is at the top dead center, the higher you get up, there's an area that where you start to curve back over the head, and in that area, there's a bubble, and you'll watch it on a machine. As the presser foot presses down, that structure resists being pressed down, and it will waver back and forth, it'll flap to the left and the right, or it'll shift and cause registration problems, uh, sometimes needle breakage, depending on what kind of backing is inside the hat, what kind of construction it has. And it can definitely cause you to uh, pop out underlay even on some single color designs. So getting up into that bubble, that's what I'm talking about, the virginal safe height. The other thing to recognize is not all hat frames, not all machines, get as close to the bill as others. So that total height is also a, a, taking into uh, account the fact that some of those gaps between the bill and the bottom of the design are a little variable. So how pro high profile hats, I like to rework in metrics, so you'll see the metrics over there on the right hand side. About two and a half inches, 65 millimeters. The mid profile, about 2.3, 58 millimeters is nice and safe, 58 to 60. Um, low profile hats, a little over two inches, but I mean, you can go up to two and a quarter. You can do that. 2.15 is great. 52 millimeters, nice safe height. And then the military and the visors, I really stick to a right at that 35 millimeter mark. Um, a lot of my designs are a little bigger than that, but it's a good chance that you won't hit the seam uh, when you're trying to avoid it if you keep at that mark. Now, like I said, there are always exceptions. Here in this, in this particular instance, you're looking at a, a completely unstructured, low-profile hat, and I have like an over three-inch design on it, and it looks fine. But here are some of the restrictions in, in the reason that it looks quite as good as it does. It's a single color with no registration problems. So honestly, if I had a bunch of little fiddly outlines or multiple colors lining up in the top of the crown, um, even on a low-profile hat that I stabilize very well, there's a possibility that I'll shift. And frankly, I think some of the, the uh, unstable hats, once properly uh, digitized and used as a stabilizer, may even be more stable than the structured hats, considering the structured hats will fight the needle, will fight the presser foot more than those unstructured hats. Also, monograms and text. As long as your underlay is an, uh, far enough away from the edges and your machine is in uh, good repair, your tensions are right, everything's working, monograms and text pretty frequently you can run really huge because as long as it's a single color, once again, and you don't worry too much about the small amount of curvature after you get up into the top of that crown, um, they're usually fine. Also, some cap and frame combinations, I have seen third-party frames where you can get just a little bit closer down to the bill and people run really large designs. Um, also, people use what I really don't recommend whatsoever, the uh, adhesive <laughs> frames where you stick down the cap crown and flatten it. You can get a pretty large section out of it. What I'll say for that is, um, Though you can get those to work pretty well with the sticky backing, the stabilizer, as it gets sewn through, tends to degrade. If you do a lot of colors or heavy stitching, uh, sometimes it'll tear away prematurely. And if it tears away prematurely, your hat's lost. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. I wouldn't use it probably for large scale uh, production myself, just because there's too much chance of that stabilizer degrading before the design is done. So single color registration, your underlay is great, your monograms and text are fine. Uh, some cap frame combinations, you can get much larger designs. Um, but I try and keep to those safe heights, not because it's the, the largest that you can possibly put on your machine, but because we're running for production, I need to make profit. If I'm losing too many hats, if I'm having too many errors up in the top and I don't, don't have good quality, which I think affects the unique value proposition of my shop, because my shop is known to be the quality shop, that it doesn't make sense for me to sell a customer a much larger design that maybe I can get done even nine out of 10 times because I don't want to lose that 10th hat. I don't want 10% spoilage. Even in a really large retail world, two to 3% spoilage is about as good as you get. Um, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have spoilage if I can help it. So I'm going to stay with those safe heights as much as possible. And this is one of the greatest tools you can have in your arsenal. And this is both for any sort of embroidery that has small detail, but it's really great for hats because hats are an especially good uh, way to explain this thing. Uh, I like to talk about the handshake distance, especially when I'm designing for headwear. And what this means, there's a, a study it's from the 60s, a sociologist did this study, particularly in the US, to try and find out about how far people stand apart from each other when they're giving a handshake to a stranger. And that handshake is generally between two and four feet, so I'm going to say around three feet between those two people whenever you're giving a handshake to a stranger. Now, we're talking about doing business. We're talking about uniforms, promotional products. That is a good distance from which to think that's where I'm going to view this hat. 
So if you can't see something on a design from three feet away, you likely won't see it on your hat. The reason this is valuable to have in your back pocket is when you have a customer who brings in a design that is full of small detail that you know technically because of just the limitations of embroidery and thread and certainly because some hats really fight uh, small detail, the, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, that the bucket will fight small detail and it's hard to use small needles and small thread on certain caps. If you have a customer who has a detailed design and you might want to talk about reducing some of the detail, um, knocking back some of the extraneous things that you really can't see, having them take their design and, and having them hold it on your head, take a handshake with them, and they, now they're that handshake distance away, you can say, okay, how much of it can you see and what part of it's important? And it can help you, like we said earlier, to get to what's essential to their design and will help you to vet from them, hey, what is it that you really want to be seen? What do you want to be legible? Maybe some of this text that's inside this logo or that you want dropped underneath it can be pulled to the side. We can change our orientation so that we can make this text larger if it's important or that we can get this design element that's important to you and make it large enough, clear enough, pull out some of the extraneous details so that we can see it from the handshake distance. Uh, it's great for left chest designs too, anything you're working on where there's just a tremendous amount of small detail or tiny text that's not working for you. Stop and have them check with the handshake distance because truthfully, unless they're just seeing it as a decoration, unless the fidelity is literally just saying, hey, this is my logo and I need it to be as close as possible, when they're talking about something that's visible, when you're talking about something that's supposed to be legible to the viewer, having them view it between two and four feet away, hey, three feet, four feet, if you have to, put a place on it with a clip on your wall to clip their art up and put a piece of tape on the ground three feet away and have them check it out. Uh, it's really the way they should evaluate most of their design work. And it's not that you can't get fine detail better than that. We all have that customer who grabs the sample and puts it up close to their face like they're going to put a jeweler's loop on it. And I understand that. And honestly, I was known for doing detail that worked at that distance. However, I was always trying to say, once again, I'm a consultant. I know that this is a design that you're trying to use to market yourself. And the best way to market yourself isn't to hide all of your details or hide your information by making it too small to see. And as you can see, there's another example of this. And I'm going to cop to this immediately. I also brought this picture in on the right to show you the difficulties of working with some military hats. That's a reject, obviously. It looks crooked. And the reason it looks crooked, even though you may think, looking from the front, because this had a curved bill, you're like, okay, it probably has a straight seam. It just looks curved because the bill is curved. When you flattened out the bill on this military hat, you found out that that tape actually had a complete curve in it that went up into the crown. So that tape that was in the front, that seam was curved and it was constantly throwing off my operators. I had to train them to look at the top seam and make sure that everything was hooped and aligned correctly to the top seam. So it caused a bunch of difficulty, and as you can see on the right, the logo dropped down over the, uh, over the seam, and we had enough room for it, but it dropped down over the seam because they were trying to align it to the part of the logo that they could see when they were working on it. They were throwing things on the hoop gauge and looking at it, and it looked straight, wasn't straight, and it ran crooked. So like I said, those safe heights are because we want to keep out of those seams, and that was one of the things that was going on. However, we're talking about design here. The people from the Santa Fe Wine Chili Fiesta came to me with the logo you see at the top. Now, that's my digitized version, not the original vector. However, as you can see, it actually had smaller lettering than that. The band around the chili and grapes, which you probably can barely make out that are in the center, was even smaller than that. And it's lettering that, though it looks okay on that right-hand side in the small ring, it was lettering that was specifically looked like wood type. It was kind of destroyed. It was kind of blobby. It was supposed to look a little rough. The thing is, they were using these as giveaways to promote the Wine Chili Fiesta. With that going on, obviously, you don't just want this tiny ring. What I had to happen is eventually, these this is actually a sample cap. Some of the caps they had were even a little darker. There wasn't a lot of contrast. So the color scheme they wanted, plus the logo they wanted, meant that you could see almost nothing of what they were trying to make out of the Fiesta. You'd have to know already that the Wine Chili Fiesta was there and kind of know their logo to make anything out. So I took a very similar type style to the type style that was inside the logo and made their Wine and Chili Fiesta text that you see here. In the end, of course, they went with this horizontal aspect. It didn't mean I got to take out that small text. I mean, that would have been nice because it's a lot harder to digitize that tiny text than it is to digitize the text that was on the left-hand side. However, uh, it did give them more bang for their buck, and they were very appreciative and came back to us year after year afterwards. So some of these things that seem like maybe this is just some technical stuff I'm telling you, what you have to imagine is when you provide them with a cap that gets them results that people see and notice when they see how good it looks in the thread, they're going to value you and it's going to be a money maker down the road. 
So with that, we're going to get into selecting your substrate. And what I mean by this is we're going to get into looking at the cap. What's about the cap that we can select, that what can we choose about it, what do we want to do to make ourselves uh, have the best time stitching caps that we can. And we all kind of know what a cap looks like. And as you can see, I'm going to talk a lot about buckram. And that's the uh, material that's behind the crown of the cap that keeps it stiff. That's the buckram. And you can see in this little segment here, we've got the eyelets, the seam tape. That's another thing I'm going to talk about a little bit. That's that fabric taping that goes over the seams that's sewn in from the inside. So the buckram or the lining is really where a lot of caps fail. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side, I actually took this photo through. I, I mean, I made a joke earlier about someone looking at a design through a jeweler's loop. That's exactly what I did on this right-hand side. What that is is a very difficult cap I was running on, and it's the inside of that cap. So you can see that buckram. What this buckram actually had, those vertical lines that are in those black vertical bars were thick, hard plastic struts. Now, they're not that thick, obviously, but they were very inflexible. They were very rigid. And what was woven in between them was an incredibly dense material. So what I like to call this, my colloquial way to call this is a, it's like 70s lawn chair buckram. That's what I always talk about. It's like it's very thick, woven, heavy, plasticky material. So this material on this hat was causing all kinds of trouble. As you can see, look how much thicker than your thread that's over there on the right-hand side or the needle that these things are. What you can see is those plastic ribs were as thick as my needle, and they were just about as stiff. I mean, they did not flex. So when I was running this design, I was having gaps and sawtoothing and all kinds of horrible edge effects on my design, not because the design was digitized improperly, not because the design was done wrong or run wrong, but because the structure of this hat was pulling the needle left and right over one rib or not, depending on how it struck the rib, it was deflecting the needle. And it was doing the same in the rough vertical because of how thick and how rough that material was. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get a really good stable crown without that because there are stable crowns that don't have it, but it is something to look for. We're going to talk about why that buckram is important and uh, why it means you should think about what caps you select when you run. This is kind of a view of the seam as a cross section. The center seam on the cap can have multiple layers. Like I said on the bottom here, the center seam can have up to six layers of material you're running through. So why do you have trouble going through the center seam of the cap? Why are you breaking needles? If you have that horrible buckram like I just showed you, imagine that that buckram comes in and folds over. The outer shell for each panel comes in and folds over. And then you have seam tape. And on top of that, you have stitching through it. So you can have six layers of material, including a folded layer of that heavy, heavy plastic material, plus the stitching that's there and you're sewing through that in the dead center of the design. Especially sometimes when you start the design there and you start maybe small tie-off stitches, you're going to drive a needle through the thickest, worst part of that cap repeatedly. And honestly, because that's where a lot of designs are going to go, I mean, even though for years and years now, I mean, really for more than 10 years now, a lot of people do like say the low left hand, low right hand positions on hats, you're frequently gonna have a design dead center front in the middle of a hat. So it's very important that when you select your hats, that you look at that buckram, that you know what you're getting into. If you've got a cap that just breaks needles constantly, think about that brand of cap and mark it off your list. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but really you need to track these caps. And when you have caps that cause you difficulty, do your best not to sell them. And here's the thing, you can do stuff with stiff seams. And the reason I even tell people about this at all is because truthfully, there are going to be customer supply situations where someone brings you a box of materials, and if you're someone who does work on contract, who does customer supplied goods, that you will have one hat. Or say they order a bunch of hats and they order all the ones that you love, but you let them get away with one hat that you're not used to, some hat that, that has that heavy buckram. You can do stuff to make it work. However, it's really pretty extreme, and it's a lot of labor. And this is, this is actually called from things that a lot of my other clients that I worked with and consulted with told me about. These are other decorators. Because truthfully, in my shop, usually I did what I'm going to recommend to you at the end, which is I selected and sold the best hats and tried to always find a version of the look someone wanted in a hat that I knew ran well. However, these are the ways people would handle these stiff seams. Uh, first one, I call it mechanical softening. The reason I put a quote on that is because what it really means is you beat the hat. Either you roll the hat back and forth in your hands, or literally the one person I knew would put their hat on a buck. They'd put something kind of like an anvil underneath the hat, and then take a rubber mallet to it and beat the seam. 
And honestly, what it did, it softened up the seam a little bit. However, that's it also scuffed up the front, and it was a tremendous amount of hand labor. You wouldn't do this on a large run. This is somebody running a single head. They felt like it was okay to do, but they weren't really charging for that labor. So for me, that's kind of a loss. A second thing people sometimes do is heat pressing. If you have a cap heat press, sometimes going ahead and just hitting it with the, the heat once before you run and not too far before you run will soften up that that had a little bit will remove a little bit of that stiffness and allow the needle to go through better. Honestly, doesn't always work, but it does work sometimes, and some people are willing to do that. Once again, that's a lot of labor per hat, so it's something that if you're not charging for, you really should be. Uh, steaming, that's another thing. If you have a garment steamer, some people were mounting up the hats and steaming all the crowns before they ran them. Um, does it help? Yes, sometimes it helps, uh, especially if you had one that was causing a lot of abrasion, I found too. People sometimes would have not only um, heavy buckram, but a thick and not very pliable crown, and sometimes those would cause issues, and the steaming seemed to soften them up, but they were steaming them for a fairly extended amount of time. Once again, something that's eating into your profit margins, if you ask me. And the other thing people do is just to try and not have that initial needle break when you first start and you're on that really difficult hat, is starting their design slightly off-center and going on a slow start when they first run. Now, personally, and I've got an asterisk next to that, truthfully, uh, slow start, Running slower may help because sometimes it allows a little time for that to rebound and allows a little time for the needle to pull out of that uh, very thick seam. It also can reduce some of your thread breaks because sometimes what you're actually seeing in a thread break is you're heating up your needle and cutting your thread. But that off-center slow start, maybe it works for the initial thread break, but if you start running and building up density of thread on top of an already dense seam and you're running at speed, eventually you're going to come back over that seam and probably break a needle if it's going to do it. If it's the kind of hat that does this reliably, um, even titanium needles, somebody will say, what about titanium needles? And I will say from very personal experience running on a 12-head machine, uh, if you're on really terrible hats, the worst of the worst, you can and will break titanium needles with regularity um, if your design is interacting with that seam in the wrong way. Um, there's no needle that can stop it on the worst hats. Now, I believe hats have gotten better over the years, but I still hear these horror stories, so I know some of these hats are still out there. So, really, my point of view, when you're selecting your substrate, you want to swap out bad caps or, at the worst, charge for the extra labor because what you can do is at least incentivize the customer. Say, here's the thing. I have two hats that look similar. Yes, maybe the second hat that runs well doesn't look exactly the same. Maybe it doesn't have the same contrast stitching or sandwich fill or, or feature that you wanted. But if we use the caps like this and I have to heat press every one of them or steam every one of them, I'm going to charge you for the heat pressing and the steaming because they don't run well. And because I'm going to break needles on my machine, I'm going to risk putting a chunk of that needle into my hook race, which is going to cause possibly to have uh, scratches on your hook race that you have to buff out unless you want to have thread breaks or you're going to seize up your machine with that chunk of needle stuck in the hook, and now you're down for periods of time. Running bad hats, especially the worst of the worst, is just not worth it, in my opinion. Now, there are some people who are going to tell you they've got the, the magic formula for it, and they may. Like I said, all, not all machines are the same, not all frames are the same, and it's entirely possible that you can have a, a combination where you can run some of these hats other people have trouble with. But... That's not for everybody. The best thing you can do is find the hats that run the best for you to keep track of the hats that run well and start your sales conversation out with these known good hats. And then, honestly, charge on customer demand. If someone says, no, I just absolutely have to have this one that has this particular racing stripe and you know it's the one that breaks needles, um, if you decide to take that order, charge accordingly and just charge more for those hats always um, because you're going to have the trouble very likely and if you have to do some sort of special magical thing to get them to work and put a lot of extra effort into it, uh, really then you're eating into your profit margin and you need to make some money to make sure you don't go under just because you've decided to take that job. So softer seams means more, uh, more options and less labor. This is actually the front of that hat that had the cartoon character on the back and here we can see that I'm on a flex fit hat. It has a fully supported crown. This is something that has quite a bit of buckram in it. It's very stable, very stiff. However, the seams were softer. The kind of buckram it was would take a needle very well, even though it kept up its uh, solid front. And I ran a fully filled design with special textures, with 3D foam. As you can see, the end of that D up at the top left-hand corner that's in 3D foam was running right over into the seam. So there's 3D foam borders, outlines, multiple colors, fully filled right over the seam, and you can't really even see the seam. That's a known good hat. That's a hat that you want to run forever. So hats like that, you can then have more options. You can run over seams. You can run off into the side. You can have anything right dead center because you know you're not going to have all that needle breakage and difficulty with threat. 
So selling those known good hats isn't just good for you in production, it's good for your client because it lets them address more of the hat. You can have larger designs and have designs that go anywhere they want placement-wise. Okay, from selecting our hat, now that we have good hats, we want to digitize for stability. Now, we've all heard it. I'm sure somebody, even if you're brand new in embroidery, probably the first thing someone told you when you talked about digitizing for a hat was make sure it's center out and bottom up. But they may not have told you exactly why that is or explained to you anything about how to do that. The thing is, if you feel a hat, if you take a hat in your hands and roll that crown around, what you're going to find out is the place where it's most stable, especially the place when it's hooped, when you have it hooked up into your frame, where it's going to be the most stable is closest to the brim because that's where it's attached to the center, it's, it, it's stable, it's attached to the crown, it's attached possibly to the material in the center seam, which is stiffer, it's going to be stable at the center, close to the brim. And what we're really trying to do is work from stability out into the unstable crown. Part of the reason why, we're going to be attaching our garment, attaching our hat, the crown, to the stabilizer that is firmly hooped, attached to the hoop, as we go. Digitizing for stability means as we run, we're going to be attaching that crown, keeping it stable, and smoothing it out toward the edges, which means, as you know, if you watch design run, there is a wave of fabric that goes in front of the presser hood, foot uh, in the apparent direction of the movement of the presser foot. You'll see that fabric kind of wave from there. If you travel entirely from left to right or from right to left, what you'll find is that wave will eventually fold over or ripple and stitch down. Like I said, just the way that we're going to stitch down our crown to get stability, if you run from left to right or right to left, what you're going to do is continue building that wave larger and larger of that material until it folds, and then you'll sew it down and have a, a wrinkle or a, a crimp or even sometimes a complete fold in your cap front. So what you really want to do is use what I like to call the tablecloth method. If you ever laid down a tablecloth and it's wrinkled, you start in the center and smooth out. Well, when we're talking about a hat, that center, instead of being the dead center of the embroidery area, the center we're talking about here is the closest point to the center of the brim. That's where the stability is. That's where it's naturally stable. So we start stitching there and then start attaching our design to the crown, moving out from that center. Also, stitching away as much as possible from the originally stitched elements, because what you'll also do, if you start stitching a design and then jump away from the central area of the design that you've already stitched down and move toward it with another element, say you're stitching toward it, that pressure foot's apparent movement is moving toward that design, you're going to build up that wave and crash it on the stable kind of rocks of the design portion you've already set up. So what you'll do is you'll make a ripple and sew it down. Once again, you'll be pinching that loose fabric against the original portion that's already stitched down. So as we run, we just want a general way. It's not going to be 100%, but we want a general movement from the center out and the bottom up so that we can take that stability, we can smooth that cap panel. It's our last chance. I mean, we're going to try and hoop smooth and make sure everything is flat as possible and stable, but the last chance we have to kind of move those wrinkles out of the way so that we don't stitch them into our design or cause registration areas is to smooth out from that center, from the stable area to the unstable area using that kind of tablecloth method. Uh, one of the classic ways people have trouble with hats and with stability is when they're talking about bordered letters. And these are just simple bordered letters. This is not like a super attractive, wonderful design, but here's the word deco, and you can see two color bordered letters, and it causes people constant uh, consternation because they'll have the borders go off register from the design underneath, usually because they decide they're going to run the entirety of one color and then the entirety of another color. The truth of the matter is that the stability in the caps usually won't hold up for this. If you try and run the entirety of one color and then the entirety of the other color, you've moved that cap around, you've had a lot of that flagging, that those waves of material, and even if you smooth things out, when you jump back and start again, you're not always in the position you want to be. So when you have separate elements like this, which this is the classic example, the border outline letter, you have two options. If you have a super stable cap and thick border, sometimes you can just do one side at a time, and this is rare, you can just say, okay, I'm going to run the blue and the E and the D, I'm going to start at the E, then go to the D from the center out to the left, then I'll run this black outline, once again, from the center out to the left, and you can sometimes do that on a very stable cap. And then you do the same thing on the right-hand side. However, what you're usually going to have to do, especially on an unstable hat, one that's causing a lot of trouble, you have thinner outlines, you want to complete one area at a time, and you can even do this with logos that are fully filled or that have a lot of detail on a filled background, you can elect to add some color breaks and do some outlining or finish one area at a time because the less movement you do between one color and the next color, 
the less distance you cover on the hat, the more chance you have of registration being stable. You do give up some efficiency because you have to do more color changes. It is going to slow down your run. However, what you gain from that is the chance for registration. So on an unstable cap, each letter filled and outlined once again from the center out. So what I would do is the fill on the E from the right to the left, then the border on the E right to the left. Fill on the D right to the left, border on the E right to the left. And then same with the C, fill on the C left to the right, border on the C left to the right, same with the O. So when you're talking about just the classic bordered letter, if you're having trouble getting things lining up, do one letter and its outline at a time. You are going to have extra color changes. It is going to be maddening. There's going to be more trimming. I get that. However, when the trouble is stability, it's running it slow at a measured pace and getting a garment you can use all day long is going to beat the profit margin on a garment that you have to throw away. So honestly, fill one area at a time. Work in one area at a time as much as you can. Move from the center out to the edge. Move from the bottom up toward the top, and you're going to have the best chance of staying in register. The next step when we're digitizing for stability is to start with an initial underlay. And when you're talking about a filled design, something where you can really stitch under and you're going to cover everything, uh, what's pretty common is to use what somebody calls, some people call an underlay tree, an underlay leaf. Uh, some people in my shop have said uh, it looks very much like a plant that you can legally now buy in Colorado. So that's why I put the little leaf in quotes there as a <laughs> humorous aside, because usually that's what someone says. I had somebody accusing me of uh, being part of that culture because of the shape of the underlay leaf. But what you can see that it does is it starts at that bottom center in that stable position, and it runs out to each edge, to the outer extreme of the design, and back. And what that allows me to do is before a design starts running at all, I can sew the crown down, very much like basting. If you're someone who comes from sewing and you understand this, or if you've done craft embroidery, they will sometimes baste down materials because craft machines tend to be a little less stable than our commercial machines. Uh, and because hats are so unstable, this is a great idea. You baste down the design before you run. So this stitches to the, the crown to the stabilizer throughout the design area. It's more flat. You've used the tablecloth method to smooth any wrinkles out toward the edge. And then you start your design. Um, usually I just do it in the first color if the first color isn't something that will show through the, the subsequent colors. I mean, if, if we've got a lot of dark colors and the first color I have to run is white, um, I may dodge or only do one area or even elect, if I'm really concerned about the stability, to use a dark color as that first leaf stitch and add a color change. Because sometimes, like I said, when the stability is uh, very key, uh, like in this piece, we had very thin uh, outlines and incredibly small text in the center there. I had to make sure that everything was going to stay stable and not move around on me. I elected to go ahead and do that. And honestly, the orange, it managed where it didn't show through, both because of the way the design was constructed um, and because of the colors that were there. I didn't see that light kind of orange color through the top. So I went ahead and used that orange and made the uh, stabilizer leaf under the design you see to the right. However, I think sometimes the stability is worth it to add that extra color change and use a color that won't show through. Um, it's not always worth it. And most of the time, I will try and use the first color just to keep things efficient. But sometimes it's what you have to do to get it to work. And what I'm going to try and do here, now this is experimental, I'm going to try and show you guys a live slow replay of a design that I did to show you a more detailed version of this center out bottom up run. And the things I'd like to have you watch for, uh, the way the fill underlay is constructed, uh, because what I've done, once again, I talked to you about how white, you can't always do that initial underlay without it showing through the top, so sometimes you're going to want to make sure to only underlay the area where you're not going to show through that color. So you're going to see that. Watch for the fill underlay and also the way I did it. I didn't use automatic underlay. I did my own so that I could underlay center out because we were doing this big, heavy design, as you can see left there, on a very weak, unstructured hat. So I had to make sure that I was going to not have ripples, not have issues in this fill design. Uh, the other thing to notice, it's not 100%. You're not always going to be able to center out and bottom up. If you do, say that fill that's in the middle, if I try to center out that fill, I'm going to have some sort of seam or distortion in the middle of the fill. And the look of the garment, obviously, the look of that, I mean, admittedly, it's distressed. And as you can see, I've used a rough texture in the fill on purpose because of the way that this design is supposed to look. Um, even with that distress, I didn't want a sharp break in the middle of my fill. So obviously, I'm not going to break it right down the middle. 
Uh, the other thing you're going to look for, like I talked about earlier, how you don't want to crash a wave of fabric onto an existing element. As we do this uh, preview, you'll see that it's moving away from the existing elements. So I'm going to go ahead and switch live into my digitizing software. So we're just going to see how this works, folks. So we may have some technical issues. If we do, what I'll do later is uh, post a YouTube video of this run so you can see it yourself. Uh, so what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to start it slow so you can watch the design run through. And you'll see there's essentially a modified version of my tree. I didn't go into the black fill. There's the fill underlay going from the center out. Then as you can see, it's not 100%. Here comes my fill on the top. I'm still running bottom up. Now, is it entirely center out? No, it's not. However, I am trying to make sure as much as I can to end toward the top where I want to end and to start from the bottom and head up. Now I'm going to go ahead and speed that up just a little bit. So we can get through the fill, and then you can see the lettering split up centered out. Same thing with the fill on top. We had the same underlay split up. Elements even in those mountains left to right, and I've hidden my travel stitches under the final border. So there you can see it's got some heavy elements because we had to really work on show through. People were very concerned about the contrast. They didn't want to see any show through, but you can definitely see how we centered out, uh, how the underlay was centered out also. I'll go ahead and play that through one more time fast. How we started with the tree to stabilize the bottom of the cap and how everything had a tendency, even though it's not 100%, to run from the bottom up and the center out. So I'm not sure how well that worked for everybody. I'm sure there's a little bit of stuttering in that video. Yeah, it's actually so I'll go ahead pretty good, Eric. So yeah, not bad. Oh, great. Right on. So honestly, yeah, it's something where obviously it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to be 100% all the time, but you will want to try and stay as much as you can, center it out, bottom up. So. Let's move into how to hoop. You want to start with stabilizer. And here's something that I see all the time. We're talking about 210 degree hoops. If you have a smaller hoop, if you have the hoops that hoop just the front panel, you're going to find that those are often more stable for doing the large, tall front panel design area because they have vertical stability. And what I mean by this is either the very old school hoops have a full window that holds the top of the crown as well as the sides, or you've got hoops that have um, the vertical bars right next to the front of the cap panels with teeth, and they'll clamp down and they hold the vertical degree stable, what I would generally call like the y-axis of the hat, the, the vertical crown area stable. However, many of us are working on these wide format frames, right? And if you're working on a wide format frame, the first thing you notice is there's nothing that is in that vertical range except for the back posts. The posts that are in the back are the only place where you have something stable attached to the frame that extends along that vertical uh, area in the hat. So what I like to use, and admittedly, it's more tearaway to use, it's more stabilizer to use, I use a full ring of stabilizer from the post to the post. Now, why am I going to do that? Uh, and also, even on caps that have heavy crowns, in fact, maybe mostly on caps that heavy crowns, because what we're going to do is stitch those crowns down to this cylinder that we've made essentially. As you can see, what I end up with is a straight, smooth cylinder. And even if I took this off the cap gauge, what you would see, I've got this clipped just so you can see the stabilizer, but it's not going to collapse just because I pull it off of there. What we've made is a stiff cylinder that goes from post to post, and that means we have a stiff little round area that's going to be riding really close to that needle plate, and that's what we want to get the best look that we can get. Plus, it also means we have a smooth back for the needle plate to rub against if there's any random seams or anything inside the hat that might want to catch on the needle plate. So we want to go all the way out to those vertical posts. So one of the things is we're tying into that vertical strength. We now have a cylinder, like a little, it's almost like a little oatmeal box, a little paper cylinder made out of our tearaway that's going to hold up the cap, especially like on a cap that has no structure to it at all. We now have something that we can smooth that material against. Then we're tying into those vertical posts. We have that vertical strength, and we're taking that vertical strength all the way around the cap to any portion. That means your sides and your front, especially on those 270s. If you're going to run more than one design, you're going to do a wide format design or a design that goes side and front. Having that full ring all the way to the back post makes it more stable, more smooth. So that's why I go with the full ring. I know it costs more because you're going to spend more in stabilizer, but Stabilizer just doesn't cost what ruined caps cost and what time costs when you have to reorder and do caps a second time. Uh, Rethreading your machine is going to cost more than you're going to spend in that stabilizer. So for me, I've found that it works. Other people, I'm sure, will say, hey, I use a little patch and it works for most of my designs. Maybe it does. But if you do heavy designs, designs that have a lot of movement in them or fronts and sides, 
Personally, I consider this just insurance. It makes the hats run better and run smoother. So the next part of the thing that people really have to get right is to align their seams. The teeth on that front strap are intended to drop into the seam between the crown and the bill. So those teeth shouldn't be above it. They shouldn't be up into your sewing area. They need to be between that crown. And you'll see, and you can actually kind of see a shadow of it on this cap here. The internal teeth are offset from that, so they really grab onto that seam. So when you're uh, hooping a hat, and this hat is actually an unstructured hat, once again, you can see just how much that ring of stabilizer holds things up. That's an unstructured hat that has absolutely nothing inside the crown, and it looks like a structured hat when it's got that stabilizer in it. Um, now, even though you see a little shadow there, this is rather smooth. And if I digitize correctly, the little bit of shadow, a little bit of ripple that I have there will be eliminated by using the tablecloth method. So you want to make sure your strap drops into the seam above the bill, and you want to make sure you're smoothing out those panels and keeping them taut toward the sides as much as you can. The next thing you want to make sure is that the side teeth are grabbing the seam at the base of the crown. Uh, in the, the design on the right-hand side or in that uh, photograph, you can see that once you've pulled out that sweat band and it's down and locked in, that the teeth that are on the upper edge of the strap grab just on the seam of the cap crown. If you do that, you have a very much better chance of having a straight line across the cap back to the side. So what ends up happening with this, if you get those teeth oriented correctly where the teeth that are in the front of the strap are under the seam between the seam and the bill, and the teeth that are on the side strap are just above that same seam on the side, it will align your hat and keep it as straight as possible going from the front of the crown to the sides. So keep smoothing the sides toward the back. Keep the bottom seam straight as you hoop. It's not always easy. It takes a lot of uh, practice to get it right while you're keeping everything under tension, admittedly, especially with a really floppy hat. But once you get a hang of it, it gives you the best chance to get a straight design, especially when you're doing wide format and doing one front design on the crown and one side design. So watch your teeth. Keep them straight. The front teeth on the strap should go inside the seam right below the front seam on the crown. The side uh, teeth should go just above the seam on the side of the crown. And once you have the seams aligned, as you can see, you can run the wide format fronts and sides in alignment. Um, you can see this is just a, this was actually a scrap hat we used to do a sample, but it was a completely unstructured, pre-washed, floppy, floppy hat. It was kind of wrinkly in the seams because it was pre-washed. And even then, you can see that the uh, volleyball smashing into the mud that's on the crown is lined up very well with the mud volleyball logo on the side and that the mud volleyball logo itself, uh, aside from, you know, it's got some wobble in it because of the type of lettering it has, it's very straight to the seam and these were run at the same time. Now, hooping backs. Truthfully, I still, to this day, with last, the last time I was hooping backs, I still like to use a regular flat hoop if I have the space. Uh, I would honestly just take the regular tearaway and make sure that I have a full span of tearaway but hoop the design area very taut in a flat hoop. Um, partially, admittedly, I come from a fairly old school shop background where we had old spectacle frames and the whole bit and people ran a cat backs like this all the time. Um, I think it really holds things straight and when you do have a logo area that's in the center that's a multicolor logo, it just gives you a pretty straight um, hooping. It keeps things very flat and very stable and if you do as I do, I do a pre-underlay, you base that down to the uh, location in the center, especially when you're doing design work or multicolor work or a border, you can hide some stitching to stitch that down and baste it down to the backing before you start running and it just works very well. Um, whereas on the, flooded, the flex fit and the fitted backs, like the one I showed you earlier, literally just hoop those reverse in the frame. Um, if you're using that full ring of stabilizer, you have that stable background to lay that material on and it runs pretty stable. So honestly, didn't have to use anything special to do that. Sometimes I've seen people use on sides and backs to do the same thing with the flex fits in the hoop, but uh, in the particular wide format we were using, because of the roundness of the hoop, we couldn't address the area we needed to for designs like that to have maybe a, a tall element on one side. So we just reversed them on a standard 270 cap degree cap frame. Not perfect, but it does work. Um, there are new clamp systems that I've seen in the last little while, and I've seen people use them very well. So I would say go ahead and investigate those. If you do a ton of catbacks, they are just faster. And the name of the game with us for profit is always going to be not just selling your value, but if you're going to stay at the same kind of price, price then the only way you're going to get more value for yourself out of get more profit is by increasing efficiency. So some of those cap uh, 
clamps that can be left on the machine and you can literally just run a cap into it, clamp them down, um, those may well make sense for you. I find that they're not uh, spectacularly much less stable than a lot of the other methods, especially reversing the cap in the frame. So for most simple, you know, designs where you have something over the cap back arch, you have a little bit of text, single color, you're going to be fine doing a cap clamp. And really the clamp systems are just much faster. Though for me, I still, like I said, until the last time I did it, used flat hoops for a lot of the cap arches. So in conclusion, to kind of settle all this out, caps, like I said before, are sewn best when you balance all the inputs. You want to design to make the best use of space, and also this means designing in such a way that small elements or elements that will be difficult on the cap, you may be able to reduce some of the detail or intimate the thing that you want to show. And actually, I'll, I'll give a small aside about that. What I always kind of show people is uh, my version of a very small US flag. When I do incredibly small United States flags, when I go to do the stars up in the canton, up in the corner, I will actually go ahead and create a field of blue or a, sometimes a field of white, depending on how, the size we get down to, and then run a cross hatch, a field of white with a cross hatch of blue on the top. Because what ends up happening is I have little diamonds in between the rows of cross hatching stitching of white that show through. And when you back away from that design for any distance that's normal to view it, it looks like little stars. Whereas digitizing and trying to stitch the individual little tiny stars would cause breaks, would maybe break needles. Are there 50 little spots in there? Who knows? Probably not. I wouldn't bother to look because what we're really trying to do is show someone the idea of the thing we're showing, especially when we're at incredibly small sizes, which is very common with the vertical limit we have on caps. It's, uh, it's like art. You don't paint leaves you paint a tree, if you paint every individual leaf, it'll eventually be muddy and horrible. You just want to intimate the thing that you're trying to show. So when you're working on things like badges, which I did quite a bit of with military patches, things like that, and I did when I was doing um, military patches, honestly, for movies, when you do that kind of work where there are small, tiny seals and text, it is okay to suggest to your client, hey, let's reduce some of this detail, let's make it very simple, and honestly, when you're doing that stuff, go online. If somebody's trying to show you a new design for, say, police patch or something else like that, have them show you the patch they brought in and then show them the sizing on the hat. You'll find that most actual patches that they have, they don't even know that they've already had their details reduced. And patch companies are going to use 60 weight threads, so they use thinner needle, thinner thread to get that detail. Now, on really awful hats, you may not be able to run 60 weight threads and thinner needles because they'll break them. So once again, this is all about that holistic way of looking at caps. You have to have the right cap. You have to design well for it. You have to digitize, as we said here, using that center up, uh, center out, bottom up, area-based sequencing if you want to get the best uh, registration. So really, digitize that balanced way. You can even, if you have, like I showed you before, a full fill design, you can underlay portions of the entire thing or start with an underlay that ties down the cap before you run. So digitize that center up area-based sequencing and finish one area at a time as you move. Sometimes adding those extra color changes is just more efficient than ruining caps. Next thing, stabilize completely and hoop carefully. Little bits of time and a little bit more material, those costs really will pay off in the fact that you don't have to uh, have ruined hats, explain to a customer why their order is not finished because you're ordering in a new replacement. Um, it's not that it will save you from always ruining things, and if your digitizing is bad, like I said before, if it's done incorrectly, sequenced incorrectly, or just not really uh, carefully done or uh, too dense, too thick over a seam, it will still cause problems. But your best chance to make anything work, despite the digitizing, is to make sure your stabilizing is done very completely, your hat's very smooth, that your panels are smooth, and that your hoop is carefully set so that it's very straight. And run at a reasonable pace. That's something I didn't really talk about, but sometimes people have troubles with caps because they're trying to run them at an incredible speed. Just because your machine can run 1,500, 1,800 stitches per minute doesn't make it a good idea because you'll have to average out, and you can even do a time study and average out running fast like that. How many times do I break thread? Uh, how many times do I break a needle? Uh, how many times does the cap slip out of the hoop? More speed is more stress on the hat, on the design, so sometimes running at a reasonable pace, just backing down your speed a little bit can improve some of the other things that go on. Like say your digitizing is not perfect, you've got some outlines that aren't running correctly, maybe it didn't stabilize quite well, it's not the best crown. Uh, sometimes slowing it up can give it a little time for that hat to relax between the presser foot slamming down and it can help a bit. So put these four things together and you have the best chance at making hats work for you.